Hans? Hans, are you in here? Hans? How did dinosaurs get a foothold to become the dominant species on Earth at one time? We'll explore that question today with paleontologist Dr. Hans Seuss. Well, I guess he's back in the studio. Welcome everyone, thanks for joining us for our season premiere of Smithsonian Science How. We're so happy to have you here. Today we're going to be exploring how dinosaurs rose to dominance. And here to help us unpack that question is paleontologist from the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History, Dr. Hans Seuss. Hi Maggie, how are you? Thank you so much for being here, Hans. Thank you. So Hans, our story starts about 200 million years ago when we know something major happened mm -hmm. on Earth to allow dinosaurs to become dominant. Yes, 200 million years ago, something really big happened, and there was a so-called mass extinction. And as a result, dinosaurs became dominant on land. Let's ask our viewers what they think caused this massive event. Good idea. Viewers, here's an opportunity to participate in a live poll with us. Tell us, what major event happened on Earth 200 million years ago? Was it massive flooding, huge volcanic eruptions, an asteroid hit, or dramatic climate change? Take a moment to think about it and put your answer in the window to the right of your video screen. And remember that this is the same place that you can post questions for our scientist, Dr. Hans Seuss, to answer during our live program, and Dr. Antoine Berovici, who's also in the chat. We're both taking a look at the responses mm -hmm. coming in, and it looks like the majority of our viewers, 56% right now, think it was an asteroid impact. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Well, scientists thought that for a long time as well, but in this particular case, the there's no asteroid involved. So, as a paleontologist, you piece together clues from the geologic record to mm -hmm. be able to put together a story. Where does our story start? Our story starts in the Triassic period, which started about 250 million years ago and ended 200 million years ago with this great extinction that we're going to talk about. So I see something that is familiar to me from the ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, does it have anything to do with marine animals? Yes, this is actually a marine animal. This is the shell of a squid-like animal called an ammonite. They were incredibly common during the Triassic period. Really, in the oceans, they probably fed on plankton. Some of the larger ones probably were also meat eaters that fed on other things, including other ammonites. And 200 million years ago, scores and scores of species of these animals vanished. In fact, the lineage almost went entirely extinct. Only a few forms made it through the extinction and then subsequently gave rise to a host of new forms. Were there any other marine animals that didn't make it through this massive event? Yes, in fact, a lot of bad things happened. A lot of sponges went extinct, and for a long time, sponges were actually the major organisms that made up reefs before modern corals took over that role. Many clams, snails, all kinds of organisms. There were microscopic organisms called conodons, which kind of look like little jaws. Which we're looking at now. like structures. These are microscopic structures that are very uh, much sought by geologists because they use them to date rocks when they're looking for oil and gas. Then here we have a marine reptile, this large lizard-like reptile that is about 10 feet in length, called a thalatosaur. 
all of these animals, this huge diversity of marine life just vanished very wow. quickly. All of that. Mm -hmm. So is there any evidence of an extinction event on land? Yes, and we actually see a very similar pattern. Lots and lots of lineages of animals and plants vanish. The plant communities go from really species rich with all kinds of conifers and ferns and other kinds of plants to basically dominated by certain types of conifers that were adapted to living in hot and dry climate. So the animal makeup at this time, what was it like in the Triassic? Well, here we have some animals that lived on land during the Triassic. Here's a little creature, which basically would have looked like a, a little horned lizard on steroids called Hypsognathus, <laughs> a little plant eater. What are those things on its side? These are little spikes that protected it, presumably against predators. Also, this one actually did get killed by a predator because there's a huge tooth hole in the snout. Wow. But these spines would have prevented it from being swallowed. There are some living animals that have similar spines. Where would they be? They, they on are their right, face? At, right at the on their cheeks. So if the predator tried to take the prey head on, they would get stuck they in would his get crawl. Stuck. Yeah. So that's this is one type of Triassic animal that completely vanished. This is an early amphibian, a distant relative of uh, frogs and salamanders today. They grew up to about, you know, skulls alone, almost eight feet in length and body over 20 feet in some cases. And then here's a gliding reptile. It has these huge long ribs and they supported a little gliding membrane. So it went from tree to tree, kind of like a flying squirrel. Wow. And all of that went all totally of those extinct. All totally vanished. Hans, you showed us a really amazing uh, collection of amphibians. Is yeah, it the actually, same as this? Yeah, this is actually the same species. This is a little guy. Well, we got to go behind the scenes here at the mm -hmm. Smithsonian to take a look at a collection of those same amphibians. Yeah. Let's show our viewers. Hans, this is awesome. Yes, this is part of a graveyard of Triassic amphibians. And these lived in a large river system. They died, their bodies fell apart, and then the river washed all of these bones together. So this isn't actually a dinosaur then? No, this is a relative of today's salamanders and frogs. So you said these went extinct about 200 yeah. million mm -hmm. years ago? Mm -hmm. And that was an important ecological change because then afterwards crocodilians come on the scene and take over in that role. The largest skulls get up to about two feet in length with an overall length for the animal of 10 feet. Did they have large teeth? Yes, they did. In fact, you can sort of still see stumps of the teeth. They tend to cuss were used to kill the prey. So they would just sit there with their mouth open until something swam by them and just grab it. Where was this found? This is from New Mexico, from a place called Lamy. But these kinds of animals lived all over North America. I'm glad they're not in our rivers today. Oh, yes. You wouldn't want to go fishing and find one of these guys. <laughs> Thank you so much, Hans. You're very welcome. Hans, I'm still happy that those are not in our rivers today. Oh, yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> I think I saw an image of what these might have looked like when they were alive mm -hmm. um, a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. I mean, they looked like pretty massive yeah, amphibians. Yeah, I imagine a cross between an alligator and, say, a hellbender, a large salamander. So. so were they the top predator of the Triassic period? They were in lakes and streams. And on land, there were other kinds of top predators, some of which also would go into the water, much like modern crocodiles. And there's a group, for instance, called the Phytosaurus. There's a really nice example of one called Smilosuchus. This animal has a skull length of sub, up to six feet, and here's a reconstruction of the wow, whole skull. Wow, it looks huge. These were gigantic predators, and they would basically eat anything they wanted. We have gut contents for some of these animals, and they basically ate everything else in the ecosystem. <laughs> so. I, wouldn't be want, I wouldn't want to be around no, those no, guys I mean, either. These, these people, these creatures were serious predators. So. so this is a whole new cast of characters yeah. that is mm -hmm. brand new to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, what did the Triassic really look like? Well, basically the Triassic was a world where all the continents formed one huge landmass called Pangaea. Climates were really warm in most places. In some places they were very dry, in other places quite wet, and it's very different from the distribution today. And are these and some of the... These are some of the creatures. This is a scene from the American Southwest, where we have a particularly good fossil record, so places like New Mexico, Arizona, and Texas. Here's another one of those phytosaurs, like Smilosuchus. Like the crocodile? -like Here's animal. an early relative of mammals called Placerius, a big plant eater, about the size of a large cow. Here's a very massively built animal. And then here's another kind of crocodile-like animal, a harmless plant eater. 
that had massive body armor to protect it against all those big predators running around. You're saying that's harmless? Yep, this was a harmless little plant eater and those spines basically protected it against being bitten on the neck in the shoulder region where a lot of predators would attack you. Just like Hypsognathus, I guess, like yeah. this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, except this one had even better body protection. So is this part of the body this, protection? Yeah, this is one of the armor plates from its back. So you see this thick, bony plate that would be run on the other side. And then there was a smaller plate often ending in a spike to the side of that. So How large did that animal get? This, this is from an animal called Typothorax, and they got up to about eight, nine feet. Some big animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thanks for helping us understand what animals went extinct, but mm -hmm. we still don't know why they went extinct. Yeah. You mentioned something about an asteroid impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the first idea because there's a huge crater in Quebec in eastern Canada that was once thought to be about 200 million years old. We now know through new and improved radiometric dating, you know, where you use radioactive elements to sort of determine the age of the rock, that it's actually about 20 million years too old. So, so if it wasn't an asteroid, what was it? Well, and that is actually what we're going to have an example of here. This is a chunk of basalt. Right this here? Is, yeah, this is lava that cooled down and formed basalt. And the answer is that it was a unparalleled episode of volcanic activity that happened when the supercontinent started breaking apart. The first sort of break that we see here, actually this is sort of an example of how, what this would have looked like. You have just massive amounts of lava pouring out of the earth. It's not the kind of explosive volcanism that people think when a volcano erupts you generally see where suddenly the whole mountain blows apart. But this was like a slow and steady supply of just enormous billions of tons of lava that came out. And this happened all along what is now today uh, the North Atlantic Ocean. So when you look at along the east coast of North America, you look in Morocco, you look in France, all the way down to West Africa and to Brazil, you have these massive layers of basalt and that poured out at the time. It's an area of about 2.7 million square miles that were covered by volcanic rock. So this basalt is 200 million years old yeah. and the same kind of basalt can be found in all of those different locations. Absolutely. And this piece is actually from the Palisade Sill, which you can see if you're standing in Manhattan and you look across the Hudson River, you see these gray cliffs. Millions of people see that. Yeah, and that's where it's from. That's the Palisade Sill. And this is this kind of volcanic rock here. So as a paleontologist, you're constantly putting together clues and this basalt must have been mm -hmm. a huge clue as yeah. to this major extinction mm -hmm. event. Yeah. So you mentioned that there were these huge eruptions happening, mm -hmm. and I can imagine life getting wiped out that were nearby, but mm -hmm. global extinction? Well, one thing that happens when large amounts of lava come out of the earth, they have dissolved gas because it's molten rock and it's full of dissolved gas. That gas gets released into the atmosphere. And there are different kinds of gases. You have your classic greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, which is poured out in enormous quantities. And there's also sulfur dioxide, which is another kind of gas. When it goes up in the atmosphere, it bonds with the water in the clouds and forms sulfuric acid droplets. That's bad enough. But those droplets actually reflect the sunlight. So for a while, things actually cool down. But then the CO2 accumulates and we get really warm temperatures the atmosphere warms up enormously. So this map here, this mm -hmm. is says it's early Jurassic. Is yeah, this what it looks see, like yeah, after that volcanic action? Yeah, this action? was after the main volcanic action. So you see the North Atlantic is opening. There's a little bit of an indication already of the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico. What was the temperature like because at of that? At that time, it was really hot. I mean, you know, you're looking at places, probably average temperatures between 90 and 100 degrees wow, throughout the year. And some places were both basically really hostile to life. We know that there were vast deserts in much of the world, and you know those would have been very hostile to so life. So the students that selected climate change and mm -hmm. volcanism were mm -hmm. both correct in that, that correct. whole question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, because at that point, there was just so much volcanic activity that climate change was all the gases going up in the atmosphere led to massive climate change. Massive changes on Earth. Mm -hmm. So Hans, we've discovered what major extinction event killed off the dinosaurs, but we still mm -hmm. haven't discovered what allowed dinosaurs to really get a foothold and reign on Earth. Mm -hmm. Before you tell us, let's ask our students Absolutely. again. Absolutely. Viewers, here's another opportunity to participate in a live poll with us. Tell us, how did the dinosaurs become dominant? They preyed on all of the other species? 
They got bigger than the other species. They were the only ones left after the extinction or they outcompeted other extinction survivors. Take a moment to think about it and put your answer in the videos in the window to the right. Well, an overwhelming ma majority of our viewers think that they preyed on all the other species. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Well, that's a good idea, but the more likely explanation is that all of their competition had vanished. Those big crocodile-like animals, both plant eaters and meat eaters, had vanished. And so they suddenly had opportunities to make a living that didn't exist for them in the Triassic. And this facilitated them growing much larger, because it's actually a good thing to be large because it A, it protects you from predators, and B, it allows you to use the ecological resources much more efficiently. So something had to survive the Triassic. Mm -hmm. A dinosaur had to make it through that event mm -hmm. to be able to actually grow into this niche. That is correct. Who made it? Well, both predatory and plant-eating dinosaurs made it. So you can see here it's little Coelophysis, the little dinosaur running in the middle of the painting. The blue and red yeah, one? the blue and red one. And we have here a close relative of Coelophysis called Syntasis from the early Jurassic. So after the extinction, and this is already a larger animal than Coelophysis, it has this little crest on its head, and it actually lived in the same, at the same time in the same place where an even larger relative of Coelophysis lived, Dilophosaurus, which had two big crests on its head. And those are some pretty sharp teeth. Yeah, no, this, this is clearly a meat eater. These are little, basically little steak knives. What else made it through the extinction event? We have, along with the meat-eating dinosaurs, we have a number of plant-eating dinosaurs, such as the massospondylus, which was an animal that grew up to about 15, 20 feet in length. It's a nice huge. skeleton from South Africa. And these, these were already very robustly built plant eaters. And these ultimately are related to the giant sauropod dinosaurs, Brontosaurus, and Diplodocus that became dominant much later, the largest plant eaters of all time. But small things survived too. Here's a, a modern Tuatara, which is a little lizard-like reptile that lives in New Zealand. And it was part of a group that was enormously diverse during the Triassic, survived into the Jurassic, and did very well. So you mentioned in one of those responses to the student questions about mm -hmm. T-Rex not reigning until way later yeah. after the Triassic. Yeah. Well, were there any T-Rex relatives after this extinction event? Well, along with these early relatives of Coelophysis, there were also very early precursors of the Tyrannosaurus. So the first Tyrannosaurus that we can really recognize as Tyrannosaurus show up about 160 million years ago. And these are nothing like the T-Rex that we know. These were much more lightly built animals. These were animals built for running. They reached a length somewhere between 15 and 20 feet. They often had like strange crests on their head as well. And so they didn't look anything like a T-Rex. These were animals that were adapted for running fast, for slicing meat, whereas T-Rex is a really stockily built animal that has massive teeth so it could eat flesh and bone. I mean, it would just grab things and just crush <laughs> now, the most recent Tyrannosaur looks scary, mm -hmm. but they all looked like they had, uh, they were serious predators. Oh, yeah, these of were all time. serious predators. Even the early ones already were like the top predators in their day. You mentioned another top predator of the mm -hmm. early Jurassic, Dilophosaurus. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that animal? Yeah, Dilophosaurus is actually a close relative of Coelophysis. It has these two big crests on its head, very sort of paper thin. In fact, they were at first not even, the people thought it was just crushed bone, but they're actually separate structures that were on the snout, and they presumably were used to either, you know, 
ad advertise males to females or as a sort of species recognition device. The other day, you took me behind the scenes here at the Smithsonian to take mm -hmm. a look at some Dilophosaurus trackways. Mm -hmm. Let's show our viewers. Yeah. Hans, this is so cool. What are we looking at? We're looking at part of a dinosaur trackway. So we have this area here of mudstone, and this was a mud flat near a lake. And you can see a really large dinosaur footprint there with three toes, like a giant bird footprint. And here's another one. This one is particularly nice because you can actually see the little impressions that the claws left. These tracks were left by large meat-eating dinosaurs, similar to the Dilophosaurus, which was the top predator around 200 million years ago. But these dinosaurs, just like humans, walk fully upright. So that's why you can see these are two, two different feet. So this animal would have just taken one big stride, and then the next stride would be off the block already. So you said this was one of the top predators 200 yeah. million mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. Was it competing with Tyrannosaurus rex? No, Tyrannosaurus rex came much, much, much later, so 65 million years ago. So this so was Tyrannosaurus rex is much closer to us than it was to this guy. Interesting. So an ancient relative. Yeah. Hans, thank you so much for sharing that welcome. with us. That was very cool. So Dilophosaurus was really king at the early Triassic. Mm -hmm. And I mean, those sharp teeth, I wouldn't want to yep. mess with him. No, nope, definitely not. <laughs> so Hans, you and I are sitting here today and we are mammals. So mm -hmm. what survived in the order of mammals from this extinction event? Something had to, right? Yeah, and it did. And actually quite a few types of things survived. We have little close mammal rep like reptiles here called uh, Caentotherium. This is an example of one. How can you, can you tell it's a mammal? It's a close relative of mammals, not actually a mammal yet, but it already has most of the mammal-like features, like just one bone in the lower jaw, and then these very elaborate cheek teeth. Mammals chew their food, and so early on mammals evolved teeth to help with really helping to break down the food. Now one advantage that mammals had in addition to chewing their food is that mammals and their relatives early on were really small animals, and small animals fare much better in extinction events than large ones. So this animal right here, can you pronounce it for this us? This is called Caentotherium. This is from Arizona. Here's a small specimen, about the size of the one that we have the skull of here. And then here is a really large one. This is one that grew up to having a skull about a foot in length. So. So Hans, we're looking at this animal right here, this pre-mammal, if you mm -hmm. will, the Dilophosaurus and the cousin mm -hmm. of the Dilophosaurus that made it through. Mm -hmm. What determined who lived and who died after this major extinction event of the Triassic? Well, that's one of the really interesting questions for biologists. You know, can you predict who would fare better in a major extinction event during a major environmental crisis? what species would do well, which species would be more likely to become extinct. And generally it's true that small species that have very broad ecological adaptations, that can eat a variety of foods, that have specialized behaviors that allow them to deal with like major environmental change, do well, whereas the big specialized animals are much more likely to go extinct. So in the modern world, if you look at a mouse or a rat, they, they thrive under almost any conditions imaginable, whereas an elephant or whale have very specific food requirements, very specific environmental requirements, and if they change, they are much more likely to become extinct. Interesting. Thank you so much for You're sharing your research here with us. We have so many student questions that I think we should get to some of oh, them. Oh, absolutely. All right, this question comes from Audely. Have you ever found any unique dinosaurs or discovered a new type of dinosaur? Yes, I have already discovered a number of new dinosaurs. In fact, right now I'm working on species number 10, a new kind of Tyrannosaur from Asia. That must be lucky, lucky number 10. Mm -hmm. This one comes from Isabella, Tamia, and Chelsea. Are there more dinosaurs that are fuzzy and furry? Well, actually it turns out that a lot of the meat-eating dinosaurs were fuzzy. They had sort of little <laughs> hair-like structures, in some cases really feather-like structures on their bodies. And that's how modern birds evolved their feathers in the first place. Feathers didn't evolve as for flight, but initially evolved presumably to keep these warm-blooded animals warm. This question comes from Madeline in Mishka. Where did you get the footprinted soil from? So that trackway that we saw mm -hmm. behind the scenes. That's a good question. This trackway comes from Virginia. There's a major stone quarry and they found layers and layers of rock with hundreds of tracks and that's where it comes from. From OC fifth grade, did any bird-like dinosaurs survive? 
Yes, actually, most of the meat-eating dinosaurs are already very bird-like in their features. And in fact, researchers have now shown with many new fossil discoveries, especially from China, that birds originally came from little meat-eating dinosaurs. Naveen wants to know, were there any dinosaurs that survived underwater? Actually, contrary to a lot of popular books, there weren't any dinosaurs in the water. There was one dinosaur that may have spent part of its life in water. It's a giant predator called Spinosaurus. And there's some recent research that shows that it most likely made much of its living eating fish and was also had anatomical features that suggest that it spent a lot of time in water, kind of like modern crocodiles. We have another question, but this one's a video. Okay. Hi, I'm Riley, and I wondered if the volcanoes hadn't happened, would humans still exist? That's a really good question, Riley. We, we may not have come into being because as long as there were dinosaurs and other large reptiles around, early humans would have had a really difficult time to make a living. So it's probably a good thing that these creatures are no longer around and let our species become what it is now. This question comes from Jade, Ella, and Aiden. How could a T-Rex be so big and its hands so tiny? Well, that's a really good question, and there's really no good answer to it. It's just in, in, during the evolution of Tyrannosaurus, the arms got smaller and smaller. There were still strongly built arms. In fact, one of my colleagues argued that the T-Rex could have lifted just with the strength of its upper arm about 800 pounds. So they were used for something, but we really haven't figured out what it is yet. They're too short to reach the mouth, so they probably were not really helpful to, for the T-Rex during eating. There really is no good explanation as yet. This one is from Sophia and Marcelo. Which dinosaur is the most dangerous? Actually, I would put my money on creatures like Velociraptor, and Deinonychus and all those sickle-toed pre predatory dinosaurs. They were very lightly built animals. They could probably m jump really well. And you know, they're with a the huge killer claw on their second toe, their long hands with other big claws and a mouthful of teeth, they would have been really nasty customers to deal with. We're getting some awesome questions, but we're just about out of time. Hans, can you tell all of our viewers and maybe future paleontologists mm -hmm. how you got into this field of paleontology? Sure. I actually, you know, a lot of kids go through a dinosaur phase. I got into this early on when I was about four years old. I had a book on prehistoric life. And it turned out that, you know, when I looked at the plates in this and saw these wonderful reconstructions of lost ancient worlds, that I just got hooked. And, I stayed with it. I studied geology and biology and became a paleontologist. Hans, thank you so much for being here today. You're very welcome. Where can our viewers learn a little bit more about your work? Well, the Smithsonian has some excellent websites. There's one on dinosaurs. There's one on geological time. And you can also, when you look for very staff scientists, like my colleague, Dr. Matthew Carano, who's the curator of dinosaurs, he and other people have detailed descriptions of what they do for the scientific research, and you can learn more through that. The other thing is there are other great resources out there. There's something called the Paleontology Portal, and the University of California at Berkeley Museum of Paleontology has a fantastic website on fossils. Thank you so much, Hans. You're very welcome. And thank you so much for all of your awesome questions. If you missed part of this show, it'll be archived later this evening at curious.si.edu. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Smithsonian Science How.